Good morning. I am coming to you today from my home in Prophetstown because the video failed that I took at the church. I was at the church today and did the service there. But we'll do it over again for those of you who couldn't make it. Today I'm going to start by sharing with you the devotions that we used in the service this morning, which would be 1 Corinthians 13, the gift of love. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions and I hand over my body, so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. And as for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, and I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now in faith, Hope and love abide. These three, and the greatest of these, is love. I'm also going to share with you the New Testament scripture that was also a part of today's sermon. It comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 31 through 37. The man with an unclean spirit. He went down to Capernaum, a city in Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbath. They were astounded at his teaching because he spoke with such great authority. In the synagogue, there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, Let us alone. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. When the demon had thrown him down before them, he came out of him without having done any harm. They were all amazed and kept saying to one another, What kind of utterance is this? For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits, and out they come. And a report about him began to reach every place in the region. Thus ends the reading of the gospel message. May we gain wisdom from its words. Today's sermon is entitled, not surprisingly, Love is the Answer. I'm going to be using a teleprompter here. It's the first time I've used it, so let's hope that it works. Last Sunday, we talked about how God is not the question. He is the answer. If you'll stretch your early Sunday morning brains to recall. This Sunday, we're focusing on both the gospel message from Luke titled The Unclean Spirit Cast Out, and also one of the most famous chapters in the entire New Testament, 1 Corinthians 13, The Way of Love. I want to start by introducing you, courtesy of the study notes in my King James Bible, to the first epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Corinthians. I couldn't resist the temptation to write once again about love, when I saw that 1 Corinthians 13 was on the lectionary suggestion for this weekend. What a beautiful prose. What engaging rhetoric. 
I can hardly believe that it was written by the Apostle Paul so many eons ago. Paul never struck me as the type of man who could write so eloquently about love. Yet here it is in all its splendor. He leaps right in to grab our heartstrings in the very first sentence of the letter to the people of Corinth. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. First Corinthians both complements and contrasts Paul's great doctrinal epistle to the saints in Rome, the Romans. While his epistle to the Romans emphasizes matters of biblical theology, 1 Corinthians is concerned with practical theology and its application to a particular local assembly in Corinth, the church which Paul began. Now, the setting. Again, I have quite a few books on ancient Christianity since I just took a class on it, which helps me help us think about Jesus and the world he lived in in the appropriate context as it was in the first century. The city of Corinth, where our scripture takes place, was a wealthy commercial center located on a narrow neck of land, only four miles wide, that is connected or that connects the Peloponnesus and northern Greece. The Peloponnesus Peninsula is a large mountainous body of land jutting southward into the Mediterranean that since antiquity has been a major region of Greece, joined to the rest of the mainland by the Isthmus of Corinth. Now, I could tell you all about the name's derivation, but your eyes would glaze over, suffice to say. It's a peninsula between Sparta and Athens, two Greek city-states that engaged in long military battles. They didn't much like each other. The city-state of Sparta was long the major rival of Athens for political and economic dominion over Greece during the classical period from about the 5th century before Christ until the Roman conquest in the 2nd century. Situated as it was, this Peloponnesian Peninsula became a crossroads for travel and commerce, both north and south and east and west. It had two harbors, one facing Italy and the other facing Asia. Its wealth was acquired by levying tolls on the travels of vessels and across the isthmus and otherwise on commerce. The original city of Corinth rose to wealth and fame during the period of the Greek city-states. It was known for its cosmopolitan culture and luxurious temples, a shining sanctuary to the Aphrodite, to Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love and beauty, was located on the gray rocky hill to the south of the city, called Acrocorinth. Visible far out to sea, this temple was serviced by a thousand slave girls who doubled as prostitutes and entertainers for the city's nightlife. Corinth's fortunes fell dramatically 146 years before Christ came when Rome besieged and sacked the city. Decades after that Roman sack, Julius Caesar built a new city on the same site 46 years before Jesus' birth. And when Paul came to Corinth in about 51 AD, it was again a thriving Roman metropolis, a thoroughfare for all commercial sailing vessels and the capital of a senatorial province, so it was really an important city. Now, religiously, the city had every type of cult its pluralistic society could bring to it. There was also a synagogue and a large contingency of Jews, along with all the Greeks who were Gentiles. From such a diverse cultural hub, a strong gospel witness from Paul might well be heard all over the world. So it is no wonder that Paul felt compelled to bear a testimony to the residents of such a city. His words would spread far and wide. Now the moral depravity of Corinth, legendary even in the ancient pagan world, vividly reflected the spiritual needs of the city, which was known as a seaman's paradise and a moral cesspool. Easy women roamed the streets and the atmosphere was polluted with the alluring aura of sin. 
Scholars believe that Corinth may provide the scathing portrait Paul paints of the deplorable behavior he cites in Romans chapter 1 verses 29 through 32, which were written by Paul when he was a guest of an influential church friend in Corinth. He spares nobody while depicting the depravity that has captured the minds of the city's populace warning of God's harsh judgment to come, saying he will repay each one according to his works. Paul came to Corinth in about AD 51 and accepted the hospitality of Aquila and his wife Priscilla, Jews exiled from Rome. During the week, he worked with them making tents and on the Sabbath, he would go to the synagogue where he reasoned with the Jews concerning Christ, staying on for 18 months. Whether Paul had a hand in ministering to this fellowship directly is not really known for certain. In any case, Apollos, an eloquent preacher from Alexandria, assumed leadership of the main Corinthian assembly at the conclusion of Paul's first visit. Paul then moved on to Ephesus, where he enjoyed what apostles, where he enjoyed what appears to be his longest ministry ever in one place. All of this is a backdrop to the essential question here. Why did Paul write the letter to the Corinthians? It has some length to it, 16 chapters in all. Well, at least two factors prompted Paul's letter. First, he had received word from two sources of division, in the Corinth church. So we went there and preached to show them that this was totally incompatible with the gospel of Christ. Second, Paul had apparently received a letter from the assembly requesting answers to a series of questions and he felt obliged to respond. Paul's intents were to rebuke the party spirit in the assembly, to encourage them to moral purity, to instruct them regarding specific doctrinal problems, and to urge their participation in the collection of a fund that was to go up to Jerusalem and inform them of his immediate and upcoming plans. In his letter dated by theologians to about 55 AD, Paul writes about a plethora of topics, but primarily speaks to the theme that believers are called into the fellowship of Jesus Christ. He is deeply disturbed that the Corinthians do not seem to understand the nature of the gospel and the need for discipline and submission to the authority of Christ and himself, Paul. Note how he uses some terms repeatedly in his letter. Knowledge, wisdom, discern, love, holy, and sanctify. Throughout the epistle, Paul reflects the intense concern of a spiritual father struggling to bring his problem children back into fellowship and submission. The thrust, though, is practical, containing instructions, corrections, rebukes, or edifications. But always one sees the heart of this great pastor apostle reaching out to a congregation with much potential, but also with many, many problems. Now, our devotions today, chapter 13, contains perhaps the greatest chapter in the Bible on the topic of love. But before that, in earlier chapters of 1 Corinthians, Paul's description of the works of the Holy Spirit, Jesus and God, links the three persons together in remarkable ways. Although Paul doesn't articulate the doctrine of the Trinity what he writes here regards the Godhead relationship, their community of persons, and becomes the raw materials used by later believers to construct the church's teaching on the Trinity. Paul emphasizes the agency of the Spirit. For him, the Spirit is not just an impersonal force or feeling. He is just as much a person within the Trinity as the Father and the Son. Accordingly, the Spirit chooses where to impart gifts as he works together with the Father and the Son to build up the church. Paul focused heavily on the gifts of the Spirit, which are intended to strengthen the church. Even so, 
they often divide the body because members of the ancient church elevated those who possessed more visible gifts, such as speaking in tongues, over those whose gifts functioned more or less in the background. In fact, this is the very problem that's facing the Corinthians. So while talking about the importance and function of these gifts in chapters 12 and 14, Paul suddenly shifts his focus to the central role that love plays in a believer's life in chapter 13. It's quite the contrast. Chapters 12 and 14, full of instructions and rebukes, sandwich the brilliance of 13. It makes me sometimes think that that chapter was ghosted years later and inserted into the epistle. Nevertheless, Paul is busily rebuking the disorders in the assembly. There were misconceptions to clarify, and he goes on and on for nine chapters of instructions before beginning his chapter on love, our scripture today. He begins the way of love with these words, and yet I will show you a more excellent way. I will show you a more excellent way. In other words, he's having to counsel them and rebuke them for their insolent, childish, craven behavior and seems to become almost exasperated that they haven't figured out for themselves what they should be focusing on is their commonalities, their food, their relatives, their faith, their socioeconomic status, whatever those commonalities are that galvanize us all into a community of one. The focus on the populace in Corinth is all wrong somehow, and Paul is so frustrated. Let me tell you a better way, he proclaims to his people. It isn't just that love is an amazing force for good. Love is permanent. Love does not energize spiritual gifts. Love is the point of all the spiritual gifts, he tells them. Love is essential for the body to be unified and for members to work together. His ancient message is still important for us today. Members of the faith body that are very different with very little in common are able to appreciate and even enjoy each other because of the love that comes when a life is submitted to God. We think that in such a community it will be easy for us to love or more honestly to feel the love. But true love is not measured by how good it makes us feel. In the context of 1 Corinthians, it would be better to say that the measure of love is its capacity for tension and disagreement without division. And that is our message today, my friends. So let me say it again. We can appreciate and enjoy each other because of the love that comes when a life is submitted to God. Love is indispensable. Now, Looking at today's gospel lesson, last week we were following Jesus when he was reading from Isaiah in the synagogue. Recall he was chased out of town. So while well, he left Nazareth, but while there he was terrorized by his own countrymen and he went on to Capernaum, another Galilean city. Again, in Capernaum, he was in the synagogue teaching on the Sabbath and as before, the people were just enthralled by his words. In attendance that day in Capernaum was a man with a demonic spirit. The demon-possessed man screamed at Jesus, Get out of here! Leave us alone! What's your agenda, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You're the Holy One, the one sent by God. Well, Jesus firmly rebuked the demon and ordered him out of the man. The spirit threw the man into a fit. He collapsed right there in the middle of the synagogue and it was clear that the demon had left the man's body. In fact, the man was fine after that, as the story goes. Everyone was shocked to see this and oh my, did they talk about it. They rivaled the farmers in my hometown having coffee on a Saturday morning at Prophetstown Family Restaurant having coffee and gossiping. They kept saying to one another, what, what kind of man is this? What kind of utterance is this? With authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits. And out they come, poof, and his fame grew. So the upshot 
my friends, of all of that is that during his Galilean ministry, many people regarded Jesus with hostility and suspicion, partly because of the large crowds, partly because of what appeared to them to be magic, which, although it was totally acceptable in that time, still created suspicion, and partly because of Christ's autonomy. He was beholden to no one except God. And it's impossible to know what someone who's autonomous, beholding to no man, afraid of nobody on earth might do next. And this could be especially dangerous and very terrifying to those in power, especially if he had a large following. As I told you last week, this man of love, Jesus, had a gift. He had a way of saying things, a special authority, a unique power. People were drawn to him, large crowds of desperate people. The essential message of Jesus can be summed up this way. The kingdom of God is available to everyone starting now. When Jesus refers to the kingdom of God, he doesn't mean something that happens after death far off in heaven. He equates the kingdom of God with God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven. So the kingdom of God is life as God intends it to be, life to the full. Life in peace and justice, life in abundance, and life in love. Individuals enter the kingdom when they enter into a relationship with Jesus, when they trust him enough to follow his ways. But make no mistake, the kingdom is about more than individual lives. It is about the transformation and renewal of all God has created. Jesus not only expresses his message of the kingdom of God in words, he also dramatizes it in deeds. Luke calls these amazing deeds signs and wonders, suggesting that these actions have symbolic meaning, which is significant and are wonderful. They fill people with awe and wonder. In the coming times, the wonder that the original eyewitnesses feel becomes even more palpable. And his actions and his miraculous works are significant signs of the kingdom of God. The excitement about Jesus spreads everywhere into every corner of the surrounding region. Villages were often very close together in those days and rumors like here at the family restaurant spread rapidly. And in that the last verse of this subsection in Luke chapter 4, Luke notes yet again the amazement of the people, this time not only at his teaching and authority, but also at his power. He's a real healer. People once blind are seeing. People who are ill are healed. He's a prophet. He's predicting the future, calling on prophets of old for his veracity, and people are beginning to follow him. Crowds gather at the mention of his name. Who is this man who proclaims to be the anointed one? Who is he? One might think that the Messiah's miracles alone would be visible proof of his power and that they would be enough to convince everyone. But in the first century, miracles were proof neither of divinity nor of messiahship. And at most, they might be used to validate an individual's message or way of life. The question was by what power or spirit they performed these miracles. And while Jesus proclaimed God to be the source of his power, some opponents accused him of using the devil. This was the issue in Jesus' lifetime. Not whether he, like a few others, could perform miracles, but by, why, but by what power he did so. Therefore, the people of Nazareth chased Jesus out of town. Now, I want to point out again that though his own people in Nazareth reject him, finding it too hard to believe that the son of a carpenter can also be a miracle worker, a healer, a teacher of ethics, and a prophet, let alone the long-awaited Messiah, the demon, the demon, a representation of evil in the world, recognizes that he is the Holy One of God. Let us alone. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. 
those who are coming to hear of him and coming to see him believe and follow him. And the demon shares his fear that love will overtake his power. Let us alone, holy one of God, he says. Jesus will go on for a while longer. We can't know for sure exactly how long he preached. Some say a few years, some say a few months. But as our wintertime turns to springtime here in Franklin Grove, we will hear more of Jesus' miraculous work on earth, more of what scholars through the centuries have figured out, and more of what he expects of those of us who have been called his disciples here on earth. But the most important takeaway from today's sermon is this. He preached with love, about love, and against evil practices, as the Apostle Paul reiterates 50 years later in his epistle. And the love of people is urged by Christ because it is good. Love overcomes all of the problems, and we are called to spread those words. Now, I know you have a pastor here in me who goes on and on about this love thing and this peace thing. But we don't have to think too long, too long to remember that that is what we are all about, we brethren. We are here because we believe in peace and love and wish to be inspired and act like Jesus would. And so you will notice that I insist quite frequently that we think hard and share our feelings about love and peace, and that we do it together, and that we do it simply. Undoubtedly, both Jesus and those in the synagogue at Nazareth knew exactly what Jesus meant when he proclaimed that the scripture was fulfilled in their presence. He is the Christ, the promised Messiah, the Son of God. Let us remember and honor him and the disciples like Paul who preached about liberty, love, and life with justice today and always, as he would have us do. Amen. Now may the gifts of peace and love and grace from our Father transform our hearts and souls today and always. May the Spirit of God grant, may the Spirit of God lead you this week as you go in peace, and may God grant us peace and embody bountiful love, especially towards those with whom we might disagree. Amen. See you next week.